embark on a captivating narrative rooted in the heart of London's war office during the late 19th century. A diligent civil servant ascended the bureaucratic ladder with a blend of grit and meticulousness. However, fate had a peculiar detour in store during a routine visit to the war office's RMD facility. Following an accidental chemical mishap, our protagonist found his vision whisked away to a desolate island in the Pacific, a phenomenon initially met with skepticism by his colleagues and war office superiors. However, his adamant assertions gradually peeled layers of doubt, unveiling to them a reality that defied explanation. Part 1. The Accident Charles Sende was born in 1853 in Plimpton, St. Mary, Devon, as the fourth of nine children to Henry and Jane Sende. As a young man, he ventured to London, where he began his career as a civil servant at the War Office in January of 1875, being appointed as a supplementary clerk. His diligence and commitment to his work didn't go unnoticed. By April of 1882, Charles was promoted to the first class, marking the beginning of a series of advancements in his professional journey. His expertise led him to a temporary assignment at the Royal Small Arms Factory in Birmingham in August of 1884. With continued exemplary performance, Charles was promoted to the higher division in July of 1887. During this period of professional growth, Charles also found love. In 1889, he married Mary Edith Muntz, adding a personal milestone to his burgeoning career. In April of 1891, his sustained dedication earned him the position of a staff officer at the War Office, a notable recognition of his valuable service and expertise. Through every stage, Charles's career reflected a trajectory of growth and commitment within the bureaucratic framework of the War Office, demonstrating his pivotal role in the administrative operations of the time. In May 1891, a mere month after his appointment as staff officer, Charles Sende's duties led him to the War Office's research and development facility located in Woolwich. The visit was aimed at acquainting him with the latest advancements in military technology vital for his new role. As he navigated through the corridors of innovation, little did he know that this day would alter the course of his life in a way he could never have foreseen. As Sedney was escorted through the various labs, an unforeseen calamity struck. An accidental release of undisclosed chemicals ensued, and before he could be evacuated to safety, the fumes overwhelmed him, casting him into a veil of unconsciousness. Upon awakening, Charles found himself ensconced in the sterile confines of a hospital room, However, as his senses gradually returned, a sense of disorientation gripped him. The reality before him seemed to sway, morphing into an unfamiliar terrain. His eyes were met not with the expected clinical white of the hospital room, but with a vivid, albeit serene, expanse of a beach touched by the gentle waves of an endless sea. His mind was a tempest of confusion, was he hallucinating? The reality before his eyes seemed to oscillate between the clinical hospital room and the tranquil yet unfamiliar shoreline. Every time he blinked, the serene shores appeared more strongly before him, each wave crashing against the shore, echoing through the chasms of his bewildered mind. The initial attempts to communicate his peculiar experience were brushed off as mere hallucinations by the medical staff, a likely side effect of the chemical exposure. Yet, the image of the tranquil shores haunted him, its reality seemingly undiminished by the passing hours. As Charles lay there, the mystery of his circumstances loomed large. Though his senses of touch and hearing kept him tethered to the mundane reality of the hospital room, his sight was now a voyage across distant waters. 
the serene, rhythmic lapping of waves against foreign shores was the only vista before his eyes. His reality had become an enigmatic blend of the known and the unknown, with the unsettling knowledge that the boundaries of his world had been irrevocably altered. Part 2 – Mixed Realities In the ensuing weeks, the confines of the hospital became both a cage and a portal for Charles. As he manoeuvred within the facility, he realized a peculiar synchrony between his movements and the vantage point of his vision on the remote island. Each stride he took translated to a step on the sandy shores or amidst the thick foliage that surrounded the mysterious island. The realization hit. He was exploring a distant tropical land while bound to the cold floors of a London hospital. With a mind both exhilarated and plagued by the bizarre reality, Charles vehemently tried to convey the authenticity of his experience to his superiors. Skepticism was a sturdy wall that met his claims initially, but his persistent and consistent descriptions of the island gradually chiseled away at the doubts. The meticulous details he provided about the island's topography and vegetation started to intrigue the higher-ups at the War Office. The breakthrough came when, under strict supervision, Charles was able to provide real-time reconnaissance of a shipwreck on the island that matched Office's records. The proof was irrefutable. The War Office quickly understood the espionage potential of such an extraordinary ability, the prospect of having an individual who could provide visual intelligence from potentially any part of the world without leaving London was too tantalizing to ignore. A series of clandestine experiments were conducted to understand and perhaps enhance this bewildering ability of Charles's. The War Office envisioned a new age of espionage, with Charles as its pioneering agent. However, as the exploratory trials progressed, the unique window to the remote island started to blur. Charles's normal vision was gradually restoring, the distant shores fading with each passing day, much to the chagrin of the eager military strategists. Before the War Office could leverage this unexpected asset, Charles's vision reverted entirely to the mundane reality of his surroundings. The foray into the unknown concluded as abruptly as it had begun, leaving behind a slew of unanswered questions and unfulfilled military fantasies. Epilogue, an opportunity lost in a story found, so what happened to Charles Sende? After the mysterious veil lifted and his extraordinary vision reverted to normalcy, Charles found himself under a form of house arrest orchestrated by the war office. The days turned into months and then years, each passing moment a blend of hope and despair for both Charles and the war office. The enforced solitude was a precaution to prevent any leakage of the uncanny events that transpired, and a faint hope lingered that the extraordinary powers might rekindle, offering once more a tantalizing promise of espionage supremacy. As the years of isolation rolled on, the War Office finally came to terms with the reality that the enigmatic door to distant shores had closed, perhaps forever. With a nod to his unwavering loyalty and resilience through the bizarre ordeal, Charles was eventually reinstated to his former position. His patience and enduring loyalty were rewarded with a promotion to senior clerk in 1903. His life once again melded into the rhythm of military bureaucracy, a stark contrast to the surreal weeks that once blurred the line between the conceivable and the fantastical. Charles continued his service until the onset of the First World War when, opting for retirement, he retreated from the bureaucratic maze that had been his world for so long. He moved to Bournemouth, appropriately enough to a house by the seaside. 
He lived through the sweeping changes of the early 20th century, finally passing away in 1934. A shroud of secrecy enveloped the peculiar tale of Charles Sende, shielding it from the public eye. The narrative was tucked away into the obscure folders of the War Office, where it remained untouched for decades. It wasn't until the late 1970s that whispers of Charles's extraordinary tale found their way into the public domain, unveiling a narrative so bewildering it seemed to belong more to the realm of fiction than reality. Intriguingly, it appeared that the celebrated author H.G. Wells, through his own clandestine channels, had been tipped off about the peculiar events surrounding Charles. Inspired, Wells spun the narrative into a short story published in 1895, subtly lifting the veil on a clandestine chapter of military intrigue and a civil servant's brief yet remarkable journey into the unknown. As the tale of Charles Sende softly echoed through the annals of military documentation and the pages of fictional narrative, the tranquil shores of a remote Pacific island seemed to shimmer faintly, a ghostly reminder of an ephemeral bridge between the ordinary and the extraordinary, a bridge once traversed by a humble civil servant in the heart of London's war office.